Hello everyone, I'm Professor Paul Carrier, and what I'd like to do now is to provide some background information for Class 7 of our Contracts 1. Let's remember where we are. We're still in the area, the main contracts area of formation, with its four elements. If there's any good news, it's that we will at least briefly cover the fourth element. That's sufficient specificity of essential terms, which is a specific terminology used by Florida and Florida courts. Uh, after which we will move into the second major category, which is breach. And we don't spend a lot of time on that. Most case books spend no time on that. We'll spend one week. Then we move into damages, which is the third major area. Damages are remedies. What you get if there's been a breach. And we have one little add-on, which is actually a defense. We cover most of the defenses in contracts too, but there's a logical reason why we cover one of them, at the end of Contracts 1. Please keep in mind, though, that you need to know it for Contracts 1, but you'll remember that its brethren and sestren are actually going to be covered at the end of Contracts 2. So, we've already done Offer. We've done several weeks on Acceptance. We've done, this is our third week on Consideration. What is Consideration? What is not? Adequate, sufficient, in flip-flop order. Remember, you ask the sufficiency question first and only go to the adequacy question if it looks like it's not a contract, but it's a gift, it's a bribe, uh, it should have belonged in the will or something other than a contract. Okay? This following week we covered things that are typically not consideration, like love and affection, uh, pre-existing duties, etc., etc. This week we're going to cover what we like to call consideration substitutes. And there's one in particular that uh, I'd like to leave you with a good understanding of. I'm sorry, I ended that sentence with a preposition. I'd like to leave you with a solid understanding of the concept of promissory estoppel as a consideration substitute. Okay? Sometimes you have a consideration problem. And whether the court implies it in law because it's unfair or the court implies it in fact because there are facts that seem to indicate why the parties did what they did. In any event, the court can take this, pop it in, and call it consideration even though legally or technically there was none. Because remember, if there's no consideration, that means that the, there's no formation. Formation has failed. So the courts find ways to put this in under appropriate circumstances to save the bargain. And on saving the bargain, the court can then enforce the contract or grant damages appropriately, okay? Um, so, I'm going to try at least quickly to explain a major difference because today we're going to be talking about promissory estoppel, which is a subset of equitable estoppel. And I think an example is probably the best way to do this. Let's say that you call your insurance company. You say, I know my payment's due tonight. Here's my credit card. And the company says, don't worry, we'll give you three days grace, get it in the mail, as long as we get it by Friday, it'll be okay. So you send the check. Later that next day, you have an accident. You haven't paid yet, you ran out the day before, the check isn't there yet, and now the insurance company decides that it's going to expect that you've paid, so you're in breach, or in fact the contract has ended because you haven't paid. You can see how unfair that would be right? Because the insurance company led you to believe that there would be no problem in coverage. Here's how equitable estoppel works, okay? The court stops the insurance company from making its argument. In other words, based on the, the duty to prevent unfairness for a lack of consideration, so to speak, because you didn't pay anything extra for your extension, did you? But you were induced to do so by what the insurance company said. The court says, insurance company, technically you have the right to say that the other party did not pay the premium on time and therefore the contract for insurance ended. But you said something that was unfair. So we are going to prevent you. We are stopping you from making that argument. And if you can't make that argument, that means that the insurance policy continues. That's equitable estoppel. That's defensive. You see how someone uses it to prevent the other side from making its own legal argument. Promissory estoppel is a subset, but it's different. And that's where the court can order somebody to do something. Okay? And so let's say for sake of example, um, I'm about to renew my insurance on time, and the insurance company tells me, I explain I have a new problem with either 
my automobiles or with my child with a pre-existing condition, that's already covered. And I ask, will you cover it? Because if you don't cover it, I will not switch insurance. I need that other coverage. And someone on the other end of the telephone says, no problem, it's covered. Okay? Now, something goes wrong a year later, you find that the coverage that was promised you, note the word promise, and on, upon which you reasonably relied in reliance, you made your switch or you repaid the premium or otherwise depended on that promise. And now you're being denied coverage based on that. Okay? What you do is, it's not the court stopping the other side from doing something. It's actually the court saying, you must do something. Insurance company, because of what you told that other person, the insured, you must include that coverage. Do you see how that's active? You must do this. You must add that coverage. It's not stopping an argument. It's forcing the other party to recognize some more coverage. Courts don't like to order people to do things, but in certain cases, like this one, it will. So that is the difference between a promissory estoppel, where the court will order a party to actually do something, which is kind of rare. And on the other side, its larger category, equitable estoppel, where the court simply stops a party from making an argument it otherwise could make, because to make that argument would be unfair for some reason. And if you can get your minds around that, it's not that complicated, but make a good attempt to see if you can understand one is defensive, one is offensive. And if you get your mind around that, I'd, I'd be very, very pleased. Okay? Now, we will also cover the fourth element of formation, which is the Florida-specific sufficient specificity of essential terms. Florida is a little bit unique in the, its verbiage, but at the end of the day, its test, its fourth element, is probably not really different than what other states use. Although it is important to be aware of the different verbiage for the test. Okay? Now, promissory estoppel has elements. That's the one where you can tell, for example, the insurance company. You must do this extra step. You must extend this extra coverage. That's the example. There has to be a promise by a party from insurer to insured in this example. You, the insurer, would have to know with the promise that the other side is probably going to rely on it. Okay? Uh, that reliance by the other party, has there has to be actual reliance, and that actual reliance has to be reasonable. Right, not unreasonable. If you promised the moon, you can't reasonably expect that to be the case. Okay? So there's this actual action or forbearance by the other party in reliance, and that reliance based on that promise would lead to manifest injustice. So courts will craft a remedy as, as, as minimal as possible to fix the problem, though, so as to prevent manifest injustice. Injustice. In this case, it would be forcing the insurance company to recognize the coverage promised. Okay? Uh, the old example is somebody promising another one $100 to run across a bridge. Have, this is a unilateral contract, by the way, and this is where you usually see this problem. If you run across the bridge, I'll give you $100. Well, I don't have to give you the $100 until you cross the bridge fully because I'm looking for performance in a unilateral contract. Halfway across, I drive by and yell, I revoke my offer. And you're running by and you're just exhausted. Well, in the old days, that was fine. You could always revoke. The offeror was master of the offer, and he or she could revoke at any point up until performance had actually been tendered. Okay? Seems unfair. So now what the courts have done there as a way of exercising promissory estoppel is that once the other party, in reliance on some promise, begins performance that performance leads to a court-implied option contract to finish. So, I try to yell, the person begins running across the bridge. If I try to yell, oh, I revoke, the other side says, sorry, the court gives me time to finish. It's like an option contract. So, if I don't finish, you don't have to pay. But I have the right to finish, and if I do finish, you have to pay. Trick question particularly for multiple choice questions, but it could be essay as well, be aware that the uh, commencement of performance, which creates this option, has a, a, a trick. Mere preparation 
rather than real performance does not count. So if, if you promise to pay me if I cut your lawn and I start cutting the lawn, now I've got the option to finish. If I buy gas the night before to put into my gas tank, that's mere preparation and it doesn't rise to the level of the performance needed to create this option. Okay? Now for the fourth element. Right, we're moving out of the third element consideration. We're done. Fourth element of contract formation. Florida calls it the sufficient specificity of essential terms. Okay? Uh, I want you to remember, if you try to make an offer, it has to have sufficient terms or definite terms for the other party to respond to. So the offer has its own definiteness or specificity requirement on its own. Then the acceptance as well, if we say the acceptance is responsive, what is it responsive to? It has to have enough to cross-reference what is in the offer. So even the acceptance, uniquely and individually, has its own definiteness requirement. Okay. When you think about looking at sufficiency of consideration, I just used the word. It too has a sufficiency angle. But now, this sufficient specificity of essential terms is unique. The offer has to have enough. The acceptance has to have enough. The consideration has to have enough. But now, the offer is definite enough. The acceptance is definite enough, at least at some level. But when you combine them, when you try to put them together, do they match or do they not match? Okay, and this is the concept of mutuality or meeting of the minds. I really mean to offer something and I give the terms. You really mean to accept something and you respond to terms, but there's some possible mistake. There needs to be a coalescence of what is being offered and what's being accepted. Okay, and I think perhaps an example is easiest. What if I have a I'm a strange person. I have all kinds of animals, and every single one I call Silky. I have a cat named Silky. I have a dog named Silky. I have a horse named Silky. I have a cow named Silky. So if I look at you and say, hey, I'll sell you Silky for $1,000, and I'm thinking of my milking cow, you look over and, and you say, wow, Silky the horse is a really great horse. I would love that. And so you turn, return, you yell back and say, I accept to buy Silky for $1,000. I was thinking cow, you were thinking horse. So my offer on cow was fine of itself. Your acceptance of horse was fine of itself, but they didn't match. So sufficient specificity of essential terms, in this case, even in Florida, really seems to be that mutuality requirement. Okay? There are certain ways where courts have addressed it under the improper acceptance, improper definiteness of offer, but if the offer looks pretty copacetic, the acceptance looks pretty copacetic with everything in it, then we have to check to see that they match, and that's the fourth element. Okay? Uh, well, that should do it for today, and I'll see you in class.